What does it look like to leave everything behind and follow Jesus? To labor for the Lord and contribute to his harvest? To love our neighbors? To make our relationship with God our first priority? To follow him by both outward appearance and inward dedication? How should we pray? What does it mean for us to lay up treasures in heaven? How can we relieve our anxieties, discern current events? How can we remain united in a world full of division? What can be done with faith the size of a mustard seed? Through parable and by example, Jesus shows us all these things as he turns his face towards Jerusalem. Here he begins the last leg of his journey to seek and to save the lost. Join us as we join him by stepping into the shoes of his disciples and together walking on the road with Jesus. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 13 for our final message here in Act 3 of our journey through the Gospel of Luke as we conclude the On the Road with Jesus section. And as you do, note that the theme in this chapter is all about how to change. And so to think about that, uh, I want to draw your attention to a news article from the New York Times called, What Brand is Your Therapist? According to author Linda Gottlieb, the practice of psychotherapy in the United States has been losing its client base and is in need of a change over the past couple of decades. In, the, in a study that lasted 11 different years, uh, the number of patients receiving psychological interventions plummeted, Dr. Gottlieb said, by 30%. The reasons for this decline are complex, uh, but Dr. Gottlieb focuses on one trend. Psychotherapy involves the long, hard work of facing our own issues, but many people today would rather blame others for their problems. In other words, uh, psychotherapists used to see patients who were unhappy and wanted to understand themselves, but now they are beginning to see more patients who come in, quote, because they want someone else or something else in their life to change, unquote. As one of Gottlieb's colleagues put it, quote, I'd see fewer and fewer people coming in and saying, I want to change myself. And so therapists are hiring rebranding consultants who are offering the following advice. Rather than say, I treat people with depression and anxiety, instead advertise your services by asking, are you having trouble with the difficult people in your life? <laughs> Rather than identify as a psychotherapist, use a more positive title like a happiness locator. <laughs> and rather than emphasize the pain and the cost of personal transformation, provide extravagant sales pitches like, you will feel empowered and at peace handling day-to-day -day struggles with a breeze. Gottlieb admits that all of this is very unprofessional and unrealistic, but at least, she says, it gets clients in the door. Wow. This trend reflects our growing tendency in this culture to blame others rather than face and confess our own shortcomings. But where does a trend like this leave room for the Christian virtues of repentance and confession of sin? And how might this trend show how we in the church minimize the cost of discipleship and promise unbiblical earthly rewards for following Jesus? And what if we really did want to change? How would we go about that? Now, my exact title here at this church is the pastor of spiritual formation. So a lot of people ask me, what in the world does that mean, spiritual formation? Well, Robert Mulholland provides an excellent definition in his book, Invitation to a Journey, where he defines it this way, spiritual formation is the process of being formed into the image of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit for the sake of others. A simple way to understand this concept of spiritual formation is that you have an outer you and you have an inner you. And the outer you is being formed all the time, for better or for worse. And just like that, in a similar way, there is an inner you. There, there are thoughts and, and feelings and desires and habitual patterns. And this inner you is also being shaped all the time. This is called spiritual formation. And so as a Christian, the idea is that I would invite the Holy Spirit to form my life. Now, my specific role here is to be the pastor of spiritual formation, so my passion as a leader is to see spiritual growth and real change in God's people. And that's why our logo here at NBC is a tree. 
it creates this rich metaphor for the Christian life that speaks to being rooted in God, and it speaks to our vision that we want to be believers who are growing and growing all of our lives into more Christ-likeness, into a life of fruitfulness. We want to be firmly planted, growing together, and made to multiply. Now, I found that most people want to change, and they want to grow, and they want to see healing in their lives. But here's the question, how? How? How do we actually have real change happen, sustainable, lasting change? I mean, how about you? If you wanted to change something in your life, how would you go about that exactly? Would you get a coach? Would you uh, take a class? Would you get a mentor? Would you get into an accountability group? Would you join a small group or a recovery group? Or would you go to a therapist? Nothing wrong with any of that, but there's lots of models of change out there And so today, I want to suggest that whatever model you choose, there is a general biblical pattern for pursuing real spiritual change, and it's found in our text today, Luke chapter 13. There are many different passages here, but we're going to connect them together under that theme. The title of the message is Following Jesus on the Narrow Way, and there's three major sections in this text, and if you want to understand how to change, you've got to understand these three sections. You have to understand the sparing of the fig tree, you have to understand the loosing of the woman, and you have to understand the weeping of the Savior. Now, as a warning, this message will jump around a little bit. I won't go in the exact order of the text of Luke chapter 13, but rest assured, we will get through all of Luke 13 by the end of this message. But first, I have an invitation to you. I have a challenge for you, and I want to meddle in your life just a little bit. Everybody as a Christian acknowledges we want to grow. But let me ask you, how are you growing right now? Yes, everybody acknowledges, yeah, Christians should grow. Okay, good. How are you growing right now? How are you being intentional about that process? Consider one area in your life where you struggle. Consider one area in your life where you have a besetting sin or something that really bothers you that that you'd really like to change. Just I invite you to open yourself up to the Holy Spirit and ask him to show you that area and keep that one area in your mind as you read the text today because it will be much more significant to you this morning. In fact, why don't we pause for prayer And I would invite you just to bow your heads and close your eyes and ask the Holy Spirit uh, to reveal an area to you right now and to speak to you about that area. Go ahead and do that. I'll give you a moment of silence to pray privately. Lord, we pray as the psalmist, search me, O God. We would invite you to do a work in us, even a new work in us. Uh, Perhaps, Lord, some of us in here today, we have heard you prompting us in a certain area for many, many years, and we have ignored you about that for so long we've actually gotten used to ignoring you. And so would you forgive us, and would you speak to us afresh? We invite you to do your transforming work for Christ's sake and for the glory of God and our good. And all God's people said, amen. So let's start with a little review. Uh, We're going to pick up where we left off last week at the beginning of Luke chapter 13. Uh, Verse 1 begins this way. If you're ready for God's word, say amen. Amen. Wake up, guys. Okay. Verse 1 says this. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. No. I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Pause for a second. The context here is some folks in verse 1 had come to Jesus on the road and they asked him about some recent national calamities. There was two current events. One where a tower tragically fell and killed a bunch of people, and another where some Galileans were offering animal sacrifices during Passover when they were viciously murdered by soldiers under Pontius Pilate. Unfortunately, the details of these two events have been lost to history. Perhaps those Galileans were a political threat 
Pilate had a reputation for being ruthless and rather bloodthirsty, but the blood of these victims were mingled together with the blood of the animal sacrifices that they were bringing during that sacred ritual, making it into a sacrilegious occasion. So some in the crowd are wondering, is this outrageous act of violence that has occurred uh, something of larger significance? Not so dissimilar today, from today, if something like a disaster strikes, like if a bridge collapses, the Francis Scott Bridge collapses or something like that, people often look for comfort with some sort of explanation. Why did this happen? And the reason why we do that is because if we can come up with a reason why it happened, then we can comfort ourselves as to why it didn't happen to us. But here, they probably also want to rope Jesus into making a political statement, wanting him to speak to the actions of Pilate as either right or wrong. But rather than answering their question directly, Jesus does what he so often does. He redirects them and answers their question with a question. Jesus says, okay, that's what happened to them, but what makes you think that they deserve that any more than, say, you would deserve something like that? Do you think you're better than them? No, I tell you. So do you see what Jesus did there? Rather than making a political comment, rather than trying to solve the problem of suffering and evil here, he says, when you see stuff like that happen, you should seize that moment as a moment of spiritual reflection for yourself. In other words, Jesus says the appropriate response to all these kinds of events is to see the nature and effects of human sin as a whole and apply that to you and every one of us. And these kinds of things should lead us to repentance. In other words, when you see calamity or someone else being judged for their sin, let that thought lead you to repentance for your own sins. That's his point. Do you do that? When you see current events happening that cause you to question why something like that would happen, does that lead you toward a path of repentance? We talked a little bit about this last week. Pastor Bob offered a definition Uh, for you, and I'll remind you what he said exactly. He said, repentance is confession of and sorrow for one's sin, followed by a commitment to change. I'll just push in on this a little bit farther. Jonathan Edwards noted that there's two kinds of repentance. First, there's the repentance of attrition. That's the repentance that is motivated by a fear of punishment. It's the repentance of Esau. Though he repented with tears, It's the repentance of a little child when you catch him with his hand in the cookie jar and he says, I'm sorry, please don't spank me. That kind of repentance is driven not by a genuine sorrow for having sinned or disobeyed, but by a desire to escape the consequences of punishment. Edward says this kind of repentance does not lead you to salvation. True repentance involves a change of heart and a change of life. True repentance is the repentance that we call the repentance of contrition. When our hearts are broken because of our sin, we are awakened to the fact that we've grievously offended a holy God and our sorrow is real. It's a godly sorrow, not a worldly sorrow, according to 2 Corinthians 7.10. Men and women of faith who experience the repentance of contrition are people who are reconciled forever to Almighty God. And if you're not sure which repentance you have, Edward said what you should do is you should keep coming to church and keep putting yourself under the ministry of the Word of God. So it's in that context that Jesus begins this first teaching today about a fig tree, a parable. Let's take a look at verse 6. Jesus speaking, verse 6 tells us, and he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Now, a parable is just a spiritual story that's made up to make a, a very profound point. And usually when you see parables in the Bible, you ask a couple common questions. First of all, you ask, where am I in the parable? And here, you're the tree, right? Actually, at that time, the tree was a reference to the people of Israel. So this parable had national significance, national overtones to it. But it can have a broader application to individual followers of God as well today, and so we will take it in both ways. In other words, I do want you to see yourself as the tree, but I also want you to see that this tree represents the nation of Israel as well. Verse 6, notice the very first thing we see here is that the owner comes looking with an expectation of fruit. Now that's a good thing, right? 
God wants his people to bear fruit. We all feel that, I hope. We all have parts of our lives or habits or relationships, and we go, this isn't good enough. It ought to be better than this. And no matter how mature we are, there's always some area that we're working on going, this should be better. Is there anything wrong with wanting that? No. This is the way a tree should be, right? Trees should bear fruit. The tree wasn't sitting in the garage somewhere. It was planted in a vineyard for the purpose of fruit bearing. But still, even though we're planted and even though we are serving God and trying sometimes, sometimes we, like this tree, don't see a lot of fruit. We don't see a lot of progress in some areas. We don't see growth. And so the parable continues, verse 7. It says, and he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Now, R.C. Sproul, commenting on this passage, says it this way, quote, Here Jesus describes the frustration of the owner of a vineyard who had invested in a fig tree, had nurtured and cared for it, but for three consecutive years it had failed to bear fruit. The owner had been patient. He had waited three full seasons and had had no return on his investment. Now, if we think about this tree as national Israel... We have to ask the question, why is the owner of this tree so disappointed in this tree? And to answer that question, I just want to pause the parable for a second. I'll come back to it, but I want to drop down in our passage to another story, and I'll come back to the fig tree parable later. Movement two, the loosing of the woman. As we drop down in Luke chapter 13, we encounter a miracle story that's found in verse 10. Let me take a look at that with you now. Verse 10, it says, on a Sabbath... Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit of, for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Now, some medical experts theorize this condition might have been spondylitis deformance. Uh, Luke, as a physician, was interested in these kind of medical terms in his gospel. This is a condition where the bones of her spine were fused into one rigid mass, and if you've ever seen someone who had that kind of condition, they are literally bent over, like doubled over uh, because of this condition. She is totally disabled. And you wonder, what was this like for her? There must have been times of discouragement. There must have been times of despondency. There must have been times of despair. This poor woman had suffered like this for 18 long years. Now, we live in a fallen world, and disability is a normal part of an abnormal world, but that doesn't make it easy. And in this case, her disability, we're told, wasn't merely physical. We're told here that there was an evil spirit involved. The woman was crippled by Satan's cruelty. Verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Amazing. This woman had suffered for almost two decades, but then Jesus saw her. He noticed her. He paid attention to her in the back of that synagogue, and he called her to come up front. And then you could just imagine the scene as she painfully and slowly makes her way up to the front of the congregation. And then with the touch of Jesus' hands, and with the power of his words, he is able to set her free. I love the King James Version where he says, Woman, thou art loosed. And immediately, she was healed. And for the first time in 18 years, she could straighten up. And her affliction is removed. And she praises and glorifies God. Can you even imagine the scene in this synagogue this day? Now, in a way, I want you all to see her physical disability as a picture of all of us in our spiritual oppression. We are all bent over from sin without the ability to free ourselves. Like her, our Lord Jesus Christ noticed us. He looked down from heaven and saw our lost and fallen state. And because of his compassion, he saw us bowed low under the power of Satan. And Luke 19 says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
And so this moment of spiritual freedom for her is a picture of the moment that we all have in our spiritual freedom that we receive in Christ, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And this is an amazing physical miracle with spiritual significance. But what was the response of the synagogue leader? The text says in verse 14 that he was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue leader said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Do you see how hard-hearted this man is? I mean, can you just, he scolds not only her, but the entire crowd for not coming to be healed on another day. He treats her with this cold indifference. And what does Jesus say to the synagogue leader? Does he say, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I forgot what day it was. Oh, oh, you know, I, I, I should have asked that lady to make an appointment on Monday. On one of the other six days, and then we uh, here, come on back up here, bend back over. <laughs> no. Verse 15. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? What's the matter with you, Jesus says? You're a ruler in the synagogue of God's people. You're in charge. Is it lawful to heal or not? You treat your animals better than this human being. You hydrate and feed your donkey if they're suffering. Should you care for an ox more than this woman? Your value system is totally upside down, it's topsy-turvy. Jesus' response is that this is hypocrisy to pit God's mercy against God's law. Verse 17, when he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. So we have a split And this is exactly why Jesus says the religious leaders, the nation of Israel at this time, were like a fig tree with no fruit on it that needed to be cut down. Which brings me back to that parable. On a national level, Israel's job was to bear good fruit for God. But here in the first century, the leaders are so turned inward. They're so completely missing their purpose. And as a result, they are like a barren tree with no fruit on it. So can you see why God's response towards the fig tree that is Israel is to just cut it down? So that's the national symbolism here. But let's think about this response on more of an individual level. Now, I'm indebted to Dr. Henry Cloud in his book, Changes That Heal, for the next insight, uh, where he says the, the, the response to cut it down is what he calls the legal response. The book of Romans says that's exactly what the law does. The law comes and sees us with no fruit, and the law condemns us. Now, many Christians, and many non-Christians, think that that's actually the message of Christianity, right? It's that there's this standard, and you guys have to live up to it, and if you don't, you're done. So you better get your act together, just try harder, try as hard as you can, keep trying harder. That's the message of Christianity, according to some people. Is that the gospel? That's the law. But the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans that the law is actually powerless to change us. Now, fortunately, the story of the fig tree does not end here with the owner's expectations and our failures. Because what happens? A vine dresser steps in. A skilled third party steps into this parable. Look at verse 8. And here's what happens. It says, and he answered him, the vine dresser speaking now to the owner, sir, Let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. Notice the plan. There are three things that he plans to do here, right? Three things. Dig around, fertilize, and give it time. 
So here's our formula for biblical change. Now, I hate formulas, but this formula is broad enough where it can apply in many different models of change, right? Let's say it together. Dig around, fertilize, give it time. First, dig around. In agricultural terms, this would mean to loosen up the soil uh, so that moisture could get to the roots of the tree a little bit more easily or to find out what exactly is going on with the tree and find out what's wrong. You had to dig around. Now, remember, the Pharisees in the Bible didn't want to dig around. They only wanted to look at the outside. We've seen that many times in the Gospel of Luke. But what does God want for us? God wants his people to work on the inside, to go a little bit deeper. If your car is broken and you take your car to the car mechanic, they don't wash the car on the outside, right? No, they pop the hood and they start digging around in there to find out what the problem is. That's the way spiritual formation operates. You actually got to dig down and find the problem and open up the hood. That's how change happens, by open up, opening up the hood of your spiritual life and being willing to face what's there. Now, spiritually speaking, what do we dig around to find? We dig around to find the truth. The truth about not just what we've been doing, but the truth about what, 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 what kind of inventory we, we see in our lives. We dig around to find not just what we say we believe, but what we really believe. And we've got, we've got a, 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 lot of, a lot of emphasis here about going to find out the root of the problem. Now, this kind of digging around in your spiritual life is going to take some courage. And that's why a lot of people don't want to dig around. And that's why a lot of Christians actually stay very isolated. And that's really not good. There are Christians in our churches that don't present any faults. Like, we're just very, we're all just very mature, fruit-bearing trees here. Every single one of us in every single area of our lives are bearing good fruit. I mean, with some people, it's like they didn't even go through the fall. Like they, like they don't have a sin nature. Do you want to know if you have a sin nature? Just check to see if you have a belly button. Just go ahead and check real quick. If you have a belly button, you have a sin nature. Okay, we're all part of Adam's family, right? Anybody need a savior? Well, I got good news. It's called the gospel. And the gospel tells us these two unshakable realities. First, it tells me I'm more sinful than I could even ever even realize and number two, the gospel also tells me that I'm more loved than I could ever even hope. The gospel is about God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense for anyone who places their trust in him. See, the gospel says, I deserve to be cut down. We all deserve to be cut down. But God has provided a way of escape. How merciful of our God. See, Christ came not only as the vine dresser, but he came as the ultimate fig tree. And he was actually cut down on our behalf. But then he rose again. And Matthew Henry says, had it not been for Christ's intercession, the whole world would have been cut down. And so recognizing our need and recognizing the importance of the vine dresser's intervention here is the beginning of any real and lasting change in your life. So since that's all of us who call ourselves Christians, I have an idea, since we're all in this thing together, let's just be allies. Let's just support each other on the road towards spiritual formation and just be real. We just need to dig around together. And can I say, growth in this capacity needs to happen in the context of community. There are many things you can successfully do alone, but Frank Wichern says growing as a Christian is not one of them. Because sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. You don't know what you need to be digging around for. So your trusted brothers and sisters can serve as mirrors to help you see areas where you need to grow. So for those of us who are here in our, our small group programs, like small group leaders, here's a challenge for us. How can we create environments which are safe for people to dig around and grow here at NBC? True story about a guy. I'll just call him Joe. That's not really his real name, uh, but I'll just call him Joe. Joe had an anger problem. Uh, he had these uncontrolled outbursts of rage. So one day he decided to join a small group and face this anger issue head on and look underneath of his anger, and he was willing to do a little digging around. The group accepted Joe, gave him some space about how to be honest about what was really going on there. It turns out over time, as he dug around, Joe found the underlying cause to all that anger is he felt incredibly lonely. And the way Joe would fix that is he would do things for people all the time, and he had trouble saying no because of those fears that he had. And the group helped him to see that and get to the root of his problem. And he became accepted by the group. 
And then he became stronger in that area, and he became more assertive about his ability to say no when he needed to. And over time, he started to relax, and over time, the anger started to be dealt with in a healthy way. Now, that wouldn't have been possible if Joe wasn't willing to dig around. So that's step one, dig around. So let me ask you, where in your life do you need to dig around? Are there some weeds or some rocks around your soil that need to be dug up? Are there some sins or hurts or false beliefs that need to be dug up and removed? Dig around. Step two. Step two, fertilize. Now notice in the parable, what does the vine dresser use to fertilize this tree? Manure, right? Does that sound pleasant? No, it's not. So this is what we call adverse circumstances. Is it just me, or have you also noticed as you look back in your life, it's often the unpleasant, difficult, adverse circumstances and trials that actually propel you to grow? Maybe that's happening to you right now. Maybe this is a very difficult season for you right now. But I wonder if you could flip the script a little bit and think of this hard season, not as the year when everything fell apart, but rather as the year when you were given fertilizer for growth and you saw very tangibly God at work in your life and what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. I wonder if this year could become the year of unprecedented growth for you. Just imagine that. Fertilize. Step one, dig around. Step two, fertilize. Okay, third part, give it time. What does the vine dresser in the parable say? Give it another year. So here's what happens in the spiritual formation process. You dig around, then you take the fertilizer of the gospel, and you begin to put it around the roots, and you will see that over time, it's not instantaneous, over time, new growth will come, new fruit will come, and new levels of maturity will come in your life. But it takes time. Spiritual growth in Jesus' kingdom is often slow, but it's powerful. Drop down with me to verse 18. Then Jesus asked, what is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds perched in the branches, in, in its branches. Verse 20, and again he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Now these two parables teach the same exact thing. Each example teaches about something small and insignificant that grows to have a significant and extensive impact. Tiny mustard seed becomes a big tree. A little tiny bit of yeast has a massive influence over the whole batch of dough. Both are slow. Both require a lot of time. But if you give it time, God, through his Holy Spirit, will bring about wonderful change and wonderful fruit. So the principle here is that spiritual formation and the kingdom of God in general grows at times invisibly and imperceptibly, but that growth is real and it's powerful, and if Christ lives in you, it is inevitable. All of this growth comes from one little seed, the seed of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and it has changed this entire world, and it will change each of you on an individual level as well. That gospel seed changes everything. So how do we grow spiritually? Number one, dig around. Number two, fertilize. Number three, give it time. At this point in the Gospel of Luke, after Jesus has rebuked the religious leaders and spoke in these parables, a question is raised about the nature of his kingdom while he's traveling on the road. Look at verse 22. It says, then Jesus went through the, the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Here he is. He's still on the road. Verse 23. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. So someone comes up to him and asks him this question, will those be, who are being saved be, be a few in number? Is something less than all of Israel going to be part of your kingdom? There was a thought in those days that all Israelites would share in the life to come. Israel kind of took that for granted as their status in the coming kingdom. But Jesus says those who are in the kingdom are not those who are born into the kingdom. Rather, it is those who are born again and who enter by faith in the Son of God. And here Jesus gives a warning. He says there's a narrow door, and you should strive to enter through the narrow door. That, that phrase, make every effort, that's, that's where we get our English word agonize. Where, where, we, where we think of athletics, where, 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 a, where an athlete kind of, kind of makes great effort as they 
as they practice. And so this passage is very confrontational to us. It, it confronts, first of all, the pluralism that is so prevalent in our day. There's over a thousand organized religions in America. Each one has their own doorway. The problem here is many people around you see your religion as a personal preference that doesn't make any difference. That's the problem. Is that really true? What if the door to eternal life actually happens to be very small? What if the way is really narrow? And what if that door will not stay open forever? What if it will shut one day? Now, it's exactly this kind of exclusivity that makes Christianity so unpalatable to your friends. Our culture complains about Christianity, about how you guys think there's only one door. But do you see how foolish that is? Imagine somebody coming over to your house and complaining that you only have one front door. Hey, why do you want me to come in your door? How come there's not many doors to your house? Imagine they start pulling off like your, your siding and pulling off a window and making a new door in the middle. You're like, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. Come through the door. You're complaining about the fact that there's only one door. It's right there, man. Put your hand on the handle and open the door. Oh, how come there's only one door? Why don't you come in? It's kind of silly, right? Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the door. There's no other way to make things right with God. There's no other way also to pursue real and lasting change. This is a sweeping rejection of every other religious system. Do you realize that? And as we're on the road with Jesus, we're about six months from the cross at this point. The closer we get uh, to Jesus' destiny, the more frequently he starts to talk about the destiny of all humanity. And you'll start to see this as a theme emerging in the Gospel of Luke. He continues, verse 25. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. Now, these are strong and serious words. What if one day the door really shuts what, what if one day the tree really will get cut down? What, what if the consequences of this issue are really that serious? What, what if there really is a hell, a place of anguish? Verse 28. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from the east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last will be first, and first will be last. Now, we're going to come back to the topic of, topic of eternal punishment when we get to Luke chapter 16, and we'll discuss hell in depth in that passage. But I want you to see right here that Jesus is starting to teach about it, that it's a very real place. And so the principle here is that we will either hail Jesus as king and enter into the feast through this narrow door, or... We will gnash our teeth as we're forced to acknowledge him after the door's shut. Now, if this were true, wouldn't this be an urgent message? May I ask you, does this message seem as urgent to you as it does to Jesus? Pascal made a famous illustration about a wager. He said, it's, it's, it's like making a decision about this. It's like making a really, really high stakes bet with enormous consequences. If you're right, great. What if you're wrong? See, life change happens as we follow Jesus on the narrow way. Final movement. Movement three, we'll see the weeping of the Savior. Verse 31 picks up this way. It says, at that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. King Herod's going to be a problem. We're going to see that in Luke chapter 23. We've actually already seen him become a problem. He beheaded John the Baptist. Uh, we read about that in Luke chapter 9. We're going to see him become a big problem later. But here there's a warning. Hey, Herod wants to kill you. Here's Jesus' response, verse, 20, verse 32. He replied, go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. 
Jesus dismisses Herod as a sly fox and vows to continue his father's mission. The phrase here, tomorrow or the next day, was a Hebrew idiom for a short period of time. Uh, we learn four things in this text. First, we learn what kind of work Jesus came to do. He came to deliver people from the devil, driving out demons. Second, we learn how long Jesus will continue until he's finished. I will reach my goal. Third, we learn why Jesus did it. He says, I must press on. He had to press on to finish his mission. And fourth, we learn what it will take. It will take him suffering. He will go to Jerusalem to die. But first, Jesus pauses to weep, to weep over the city, 34. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. The twice naming of Jerusalem, Jerusalem was an idiom that implied deep affection. You may recall King David, when he lost his son, cried out, Absalom, Absalom. Jesus is mourning over his city, Jerusalem, as a father mourns over a wayward son. These are not words of indignation from our compassionate Savior. They are words of mercy and love. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33 says, there are tears here. There is grief here. There is sadness here. There is lament here. There is compassion here for his people, though they are so stiff-necked. Do you realize what that means? If God has compassion for them, then that means God has compassion for you. If Jesus weeps over them, that means Jesus weeps over you. Longing for his people to come back to him. This is the mission that he continues as he goes along the road to seek and to save the lost. So what do we learn in this whole chapter, chapter 13? We learn that God wants us to come to him in true repentance, that God wants to change us as we turn to him in repentance, and through this, God wants us to bear fruit. And we ought to do this today because time is short Growth takes time, right? But remember, we don't have forever. We do have time, but we don't have unlimited time. And the sad reality is that history actually tells us that Israel did not heed his warning. And then in A.D. 70, the legions came, and they destroyed Jerusalem, just as Jesus said. Verse 35, look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Commentator Mike McKinley says, quote, we should not allow the distance of time and culture to make us miss the fact that Jesus' warning applies to us as well. There is coming a day on which you will be called to give an account for the fruitlessness of your life. Like the two examples in Luke 13, 1 through 5, you may not get advance notice when disaster is about to fall upon you. Friends, we don't have forever to come to God and repent for our sins and to seek to bear fruit in our lives. We have to take this call urgently and seriously. It's not that it's too late right now, but it's urgent. So I encourage you, I implore you to get serious about those areas in your life that aren't bearing fruit. Because one day, this opportunity will pass. You ever play board games with your family and friends? What's your favorite board game? Just shout it out. What do you like? Clue, Clue Scrabble. What else? I like Settlers of Catan. Anybody Settlers fans out there? Board games are great. But no matter what game it is, when the game is over, everything goes back in the box. The pieces go back, the cards go back, the dice go back, the dominoes go back. Everything goes back. And then in the moment of finality, we close the box. Game over. Friends, one day, you're going to be at the front of a church in a box, and they're going to close the box. Game over. And when people come up and talk about you on that day, you know what they're going to talk about? They're not going to talk about your 401k. They're not going to talk about how much you knew about baseball. They're not going to talk about how many sales you made at work. They're going to come up and they're going to talk about the fruitfulness they saw in your life. 
They're going to come up and they're going to talk about the fruitfulness they saw as you loved your family. They saw, as they, they saw you love your family. They're going to talk about the fruitfulness that you displayed in the church that you were a part of. And they're going to talk about the fruitfulness they saw in the spiritual maturity that you manifested in your life. But friends, those things don't happen by accident. They're intentional. And so the question for all of us here is, what are we doing now with the time that we have? What are those areas in my life and your life where we are not bearing fruit? Are we willing to address them? Are you willing to address them to intentionally dig around, fertilize, and give God time to help you spiritually grow? That's my challenge for us today. Choose to make this year a year of unprecedented spiritual growth. Now let me just get a little bit more specific. Do you have a place? Do you have an environment in your life where you can go to in the context of grace and truth and work on healing and work on growing and work on spiritual formation with people that you trust? Don't do this alone. Who are the people around you that that are willing to be allies with you in this process of growth. Here at NBC, we have several opportunities for spiritual formation. We have adult education classes, we have small groups, we have women's Bible studies, we have men's radical mentoring groups. Let me encourage you to prayerfully consider how is God initiating in your life to nudge you to plug in and grow. Especially if you're new, I encourage you to plug in and make some new friendships. And let's make this year a year of unprecedented spiritual formation and fruitfulness in our lives. Can you imagine a church full of men and women who were really serious about bearing fruit? Can you imagine a church full of people, firmly planted, growing together, and made to multiply? Let's be that church. Let's pray together as the worship team comes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your patience with us. Holy Spirit, thank you for revealing to us faithfully areas in our lives where you're nudging us, where you're pointing us uh, towards something better. I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that you would just clear away the clutter of anything that this pastor has said today uh, that would distract them from what you're calling them to do right now. And I pray that you would focus their attention on the area that you would like them to focus on. And Lord, we'll give you very... We'll be very careful to give you all of the glory for the change that you have not only brought about in our lives up until now, but the change that you are going to do as we believe that you who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So we open ourselves wide to you and we decide to follow you. No turning back, no turning back. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Would you please stand?